Welcome to the Two Month Review, the weekly podcast from 3% and Open Letter, in which we take one complicated, long book, break it down section by section, recap it, talk about it, discuss it, analyze it, joke about it, have fun with it. We are currently in the seventh season of the Two Month Review, and we are reading Radiant Terminus by Antoine Bulladine, which was translated by Jeffrey Zuckerman. Um, as always, I am Chad Post from Open Letter Books, and this week we don't have Brian Wood because he has no voice. Um, woke up and couldn't talk, so he didn't want to make everyone suffer through that. So filling in last second is Kai Strominus, the editor at Open Letter, who worked on this translation. I did. Hello. And our special guest is Rhett McNeil, translator, a current resident in, of Tulsa, um, writer, everything. Yeah. Hello. Funny, Hi. funny guy. <laughs> um, <laughs> likes to play baseball. Indeed. Which we will, we will get into. Do you want to, for, before we get into the book itself, we're going to be, to, this today we're talking about the first few chapters of the second part, which is called um, Ode to the Camps. And specifically, we're talking about chapters 9 through 13, or pages 131 through 193. Um, and we'll get into that. But first, what, do you want to tell us a bit about like your experience as a, as a translator? Because I, I don't want to speak for you, but you've done a lot of stuff. Yeah. Um... I'm actually uh, turning in a manuscript later today. It's a busy, busy nice. day for me. This series of books. Uh, it's an author I've worked with before, Gonzalo Tavares, oh. um, a Portuguese author. Um, and this is his first, uh, I've done an epic poem by him and a couple of novels. Um, and these are like poetry or philosophy. They're not, uh, they should be neither in contention for the poetry, BTBA, nor the... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> nor, or for the fiction, both. nor the fiction one or for or both, for yeah, both. Yeah, yeah yeah um and there it's a series of books coming out from quantum prose which is a small outfit out of new york city sometime this summer i've done a lot of books for dalkey archive some for hispa books from spanish and portuguese and i'm a writer in residence at this uh tulsa artist fellowship and yeah, teach at the this? university of tulsa what is this tulsa artist art, artist fellowship good question it's a uh, it's it's crazy. There are visual artists and then writers of all sports, um, and it is uh, no strings attached, non project based um, fellowship that brings artists from all over the country to Tulsa, houses them, gives them office space or studio space for the visual artists, and you just do your thing. It's kind of unbelievable. It's founded by the by this uh, benevolent billionaire who kind of funds all the cool stuff that's going on in Tulsa. Um, and it's very lovely. I've started a baseball team here, as I told you about, Chad. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, I want to come play on your baseball team. Yeah, I'll have to bring you out this summer when it's in full swing. Um, right on. I'm always down. I'm always down for a little ball. I can, I, I can, uh, I can, I can, I can whiff profusely at any moment in time. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. <laughs> and when we, we uh, everybody's drunk and smoking cigarettes and oh. sometimes other stuff. So oh, no one's even better. No one's in top shape. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, one, the one time I ever got picked off on a uh, first base because I usually pretty fast and steal a lot, but I was playing in the old old man league here. I was super stone hung over. Just got nailed, and it was like I was so embarrassed. <laughs> I was like, my reaction time was so slow that it was like just awful. But anyways, um, so uh, how did you did, have you read Volodin before? I have. I read one of the ones you. I did. I read. Uh, Bardo or not Bardo when okay. it came out. Um, and that one, I guess, for... I mean, when going into this one and Bardo as well, I kind of knew that this extended universe existed. Mm -hmm. And kind of in the same way with other series or, um, you know, larger multi-book projects, I kind of didn't know where I should dip my toe in. I know. Um, but that seemed as good a book as any. As yeah. does this one. I mean, you kind of start to feel the rhythm of it, of it about 30 pages in. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and it didn't seem like neither that book nor this book seemed uh, daunting or like I was joining a narrative uh, halfway through. It's just like you enter this universe wherever you enter it, I suppose. Yeah, absolutely. And that's the thing. I mean, it's hard for me to say because I can't read French, but to like be able to see what the overall map or meta structure is of his like 40, supposed 49 novels, 40 three of which I guess are written. Um, because some of them, I think I mentioned this on the earlier podcast, but some of them take the form of like Radiant Terminus where it's like a novel, like a, a essentially a novel. And some of the character names 
re-exist or reappear in other books of his, but, and there's a lot of references to the post-exotic writers, and, but it's like in a different point in time or space as some of the other books. And then there's the ones like um, writers uh, that Delkey did or post-exoticism or post-exoticism in 10 lessons, less than 11, which are more like the theory part of it or explaining a okay. little bit more about the characters or about what post-exoticism is more directly. So there's like a lot okay. of different layers to it. And there's no, I don't know what the topography if there's, if you can even apply that word yeah. but, um, to, of like what his whole setup would be, but there are all these like kind of different parts of it. And Bardo and Radiant Terminus, I think are the best to get into because they are fairly straightforward in a sense. So yeah. you can read them, you don't feel like you're, you don't know what's going on or like these characters existed before. But then when you start reading more of his books, it's the fun part of like, oh wait, this is that, I remember this reference or like, I know the story of the post-exotic writers are sure. all jailed and murdered and like, now they're all gone and now we're in a world in which they're not helping out anymore and so the soviet union's falling apart and the capitalists are on the rise again because the post-exotic writers are gone so you can sort of like place and sort of let things bounce off one another but i don't know that there's like an order to them by any means like would, the way there would be for like um like uh, uh george rr R. martin uh books sure yeah, yeah like i don't think you can just jump into game of thrones at volume seven and and understand what's going on with the yeah. ice frost fucking kings or whatever um i actually have a question about those two books yeah that you just showed chad are those um explanations by Voldine of what's going on within his um within his project or are they like documents from within the universe documents from within the universe gotcha um, okay so, cool. yeah so like uh, post exoticism and 10 lessons is starts with the story of uh, Lutz Bassman is in jail and he's dying and it's sort of going through like his dying and why he's imprisoned and and what's happening with like the post exoticism stuff and then in the middle there'll be these lessons which for anyone watching can see where like lesson one is like a fragmentary inventory of deceased dissidents and it's just a list of names and the okay. year that they died and then like um, a later lesson will be like a review of Minor Angels, but it's not the same Minor Angels that was published in English. It's a totally different book that's made okay. up. Um, but then there's like um, the most I think important the ones. The last one is just a list of other titles. That's where I'm getting all the stuff for our game from. The yeah. last one is uh, by the same author in the same collection. It's just a list of all post exotic books that exist within this oh, universe. Like a bibliography of. A bibliography yeah. of okay, 100, cool. of two, no, three, 343 different books. Um, and it has all the author's okay, names. I and, love that. And whether they're and then they're, in the middle, there's all these sections that are like romance. So it explains what the romance is, um, which is what um, uh, what should I call it? What uh, Radiant Terminus would be, I believe. And then there's like novels or interjects that are like another form, more like Bardo or not Bardo, and like the Lutz Passman okay. books. And then like some other specific terms that they use, like a murmur act, Narrow. um, a nair act, uh, and yeah. all the different like ways that they two work two words on our Bardo. Um, so it's it's got like kind of more explanatory like here's what this means in like this world of post exotic authors. And then reading this, like if you've read any of the others, it's like, oh, okay, I get, cause they'll make reference to that in Radiant Terminus to like Maria Qualls, like Narax or her, like her, they okay. use the weird yeah, word. Yeah. It doesn't say like novels or stories or sure. whatever. So it sort of explains that. Um, but it more, more importantly within this one gives like the kind of um, spiritual nature of what the project is like why does post exoticism exist it's trying to smuggle in information within like a system that was going to crush dissidents and crush rebellion underneath the capitalist sort of weight and power okay and the post exotics post exoticist writers are trying to like use those existent forms but tweak them by bringing in information that otherwise would be banned by the system and tricking it and part of it's okay. through dreams and part of it's through like creation of dreams in the reader so that it's not the words on the page because those would be get you in trouble, but like the impact that it has afterwards. So it becomes like really like you could take it. People who are obsessed with building can take this into like long philosophical and semantic sort of uh, places with sure. like what, what it means for writing and for translation and for how books are perceived and reader responses and all that kind of fun stuff. And the for one, what he might be trying to do with this 49 book. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, with writers, it's a just it's bios of a bunch of of the of the post exoticist writers, sort of like um, Nazi literature in the Americas by Bolaño. Um, okay, and they're all dead, and so it like tells like how they became writers and like what their sort of like work was like, and then how they died, and like what their okay. what their painful life was. So it's it's fun, and it's got some stuff that like really applies to this book, which I, I think I'll come 
I'll do it at a different point in time because I don't have it marked here, right? But um, but there are some things that like sort of reflect on radiant terminus. Um, but it's it's fun. So it does yeah, it all starts to like once you get into it, you can just start linking them together or just read them separately. Like there's no yeah. need for someone to be compulsive and read everything, but each one has like a different sort of perspective and it's it's very fun to read. Okay. So before we get into it though, too, we have our game. So every week we ask the guests to like imagine what one of these post-exotic writers would be um, if they were real. So you yeah. get an interesting one. You get the Wernieri cell. Can you say that one more time? <laughs> Wernieri cell. Wernieri cell. This sounds, uh, I want to say a factory foreman. Ooh. Factory foreman at like a place that uh, cans motor oil, something like that. <laughs> I love how all of our post-exotic writers are like, 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 just you know, uh, proletariat. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. Failed exactly. tennis work players, exactly. Tennis yeah, coaches, yeah. factory foreman. No, no petite bourgeoisie in this. Uh, in no, this that's pretty appropriate. Yeah. yeah. Fuck the petty bourgeoisie in here. <laughs> the fat hippie who who dispenses wisdom, Kirill Gampo. Oh yeah, that was a good one. That was a good one. <laughs> yeah, we got a lot of them. So also, if you're listening to this or watching, like the other game that we have going on right now for this season is that Radiant Terminus is loaded with imaginary of uh, or plants, which um, I'm going to refer to in a second uh, again. But like in the first chapter, um, uh, whatever his name is, Cronauer starts naming all these plants that exist in this landscape, this post-nuclear apocalypse landscape, and making up names for them. And they're all like not real plants. So anyone that draws, draw your what you think one of these plants looks like with the name, and we will show it on air. Um, the one that's our, that's deemed our favorite will win copies of all of his books. But also, we want to be able to take everyone's drawings and make like a little broadside for Radiant Terminus. So if people draw and like just sketch a sketch a sketch Hell a yeah. plant. Put a name to it. You have so many great names in here. Just to let it inspire you. Um, so yeah, so I guess there's the only other thing I want to do before we start talking about this specifically is sort of recap where we were for everyone. So the first part of the book we is the only part that we've been going through, and that is titled The Coal Host, um, which is all about Radiant Terminus and about Kronauer. So it begins with Kronauer, Ilyshenko, and Vasilevsa, um, Marchavili all like arriving they've all left the second soviet union as it's fallen apart they were part of like an army trying to protect it but their commander was crazy so they shot and killed him and they've gone off into the the rest of the world to try and find a way to survive as long as they can with their bodies like penetrated by radiation and not doing so well and there's no food and society's completely fallen apart at the beginning they find they end up at the red star which is a has a nuclear um plant there but it's like abandoned and there's a train with some soldiers that kind of pulls up and vasilisa is dying like real dying. And so Kronauer leaves thinking that he can get to the smoke in the distance where they'll be able to get water and get help for her and come back and save them. And the rest of the first part is his adventures in that place where Solove is the leader of this, this commune and can enter people's minds and like basically like mind, mind rapes his daughters repeatedly and is like a bad person and has a, a conflict with Kronauer. Now in chapter nine, we, we've moved to part two, Ode to the Camps, and we're right back at the beginning. We're back where Kronauer has just left, and Vasilisa and um, Il Ilyshenko are there at that place where he abandoned them outside of the Red Star. The train's right there, and they're trying, and, and he's Ilyshenko's trying to think of what to do and what he should do with her. Like, should he bring her to these to these soldiers? Are they trustworthy? Are they not? Are they going to shoot her? Are they going to kill her? What's going to happen? Um, and he's not sure what to do, um, and he ends up going to see them, and. That, which is the one part that I was mentioning real quick. When he goes to walk over to to them carrying her body, he references that they are in an indistinct sea of no, now unnamed grasses, which is a real interesting twist. Because right away, when it was Crown Hour talking, he starts naming everything like almost like an atom figure. And Ilyushenko is like, "These grasses have no name," which I think <laughs> is a neat contrast. But he brings them over. And um, this is one of the things that we talked about on the first episode too, where in a lot of post-apocalyptic books, one of the big questions is whether the humanity that's fragmented is naturally good or evil. And so far there's been so many examples of every time that there's a male, they're like raping, murdering, killing, violent. It's all violent terminology, it's all violent acts. And so he's naturally suspicious, but he takes the, takes her over to the, to the people and they're like, well, we're not gonna eat her. <laughs> like, we don't, we don't eat people, <laughs> but. But it, so it's, so they are, I guess, good. But anyway, so what did you think of this section? 
this chapter in particular? Um, I'll go first. Okay. Yeah, go for it. Sky, um, Sky doesn't remember. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, this was so we've sort of switched focus from Cronauer and Radiant Terminus back to um, his two friends that he's left to try to save, right? Yep. Um, and it was interesting, well, yeah, when he, he basically only approaches them after she's died because of this fear, this persistent fear of rape that is just omnipresent in this book. And yep. which apparently, you know, some of this, the, the post-exotic writing is referred to as like ardently feminist and especially this one writer i think her name was maria qual yeah maria qual who um you know just describes the human race as sort of descended from millennia of the world's best rapists and describes yeah. all sex acts and the uh, consummation thereof the orgasm is just like a recalling of this horrid in history and, this, and most of the characters seem to have a sense of this, either afraid of it, as like Samia was earlier mm -hmm. in the book, or as Kronauer and Ilyushenko are, Ilyushenko are on behalf of Vasilisa, or like Solovye uh, seems to be, you know, this, you know, genetic mutant who possesses all of this, uh, you know, mental and physical virility in the face of everyone else kind of dying. Um, and so it, everyone seems to exist on these like terrible fear rape or getting raped or their friends getting raped, or on the other hand, you know, these, you know, vile characters like Solovie is. Yeah, absolutely. And so he, he only really, he only brings Vasilisa over once she's dead because he's like, well, now no harm can come to her. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and as you say, you know, as soon as he approaches, you know, that he gets this weird response like, well, we're not going to eat her be because it's forbidden by Marxism, Leninism <laughs> yep. principles, you know, Marxist Leninist principles forbid it. And then, of course, as this chapter goes along, th the threat of rape recurs like there's no escaping it, even in death. Yeah, yeah, that's going to come up in that in the next chapter, definitely. But there's one part too, like related to what you're saying. Um, on 134, he's like, when he's looking at them and he's watching the soldiers, he's like, they seemed calm, but any horde of males could suddenly lose reason and become aggressive. Um, the moralities of killers and rapists would supplant our own. Ancestral cruelties would no longer be taboo. And once again, as in the hideous period preceding the establishment of the Second Soviet Union, humanity would regress to its earlier stage as cavemen. Its ideologists would rally around those who had once advocated inequality and injustice. Its mercenary poets would sing the culture of masters. Ragtag soldiers would no longer be kept on a leash. The old dance of idiocy and blood would play out again, which is really powerful. So that's the vision of the world. Like the net, it's, it's almost like it's positing that that is the natural state of the world that left to its own devices, capitalism and, and violence and rape, and that will all be taking over. And, uh, and both Ilyushenko and Kronauer are trying to not do that. Like they're they're very much not trying. Like he's Kronauer was so aware of like not wanting to be uh, inappropriate with Samaya, and like they both like have their deal with um, Vasilisa, where they're like, well, we're we're not lovers. We're all we can't do that because that will cause problems. We're gonna bond with other humans. So, like that connection with humans is still a difficult thing and something that they're they're very concerned with trying to achieve. Yeah, and it's it's funny. I feel like and Kaya, maybe you can comment on this because it kind of has more to do with the broader um, sort of political landscape of this novel and the others, but this idea that, you know, in part Kronauer and Ilyushenko are uninterested in sex because, you know, the party and the communistic system sort of deems it, uh, you know, it's kind of like bourgeois pleasure. And yeah. so they see each other as comrades and in, as brothers and sisters in arms and don't view each other in that same sort of way and have been taught to do so. Whereas on the other hand, the capitalists and the fascists are these like raping and murdering hordes. And there seems to be this, uh, you know, vacillation between these two, the ideal of the second Soviet Union and this uh, brother and sisterhood of humankind and the fascist one where people just, exp you know, people in power exploit those without power. Yeah, and I think there's a just that overarching sense of nihilism too. Like you're talking about the act of sex being a bougie, like a bougie thing, but at the same time, like 
what is pleasure anymore? <laughs> like there's yeah, nothing, yeah, yeah. there's, there's nothing <laughs> fun or good that'll come of it anyway. So almost why bother? I, I, I think the pleasure is like not dying from having radiation poisoning. <laughs> But we're all gonna die anyway. I mean, <laughs> that's, uh, that's yeah, like maybe. The, I don't know. You know what I mean, that, like that's, yeah. that's their that's their sense right now yeah. that you're just like drawing out your moments. And you know, like for us, popular popular culture always has those apocalyptic movies where someone's like, you know, tell the tell your high school crush that you've you know loved her since you were kids, or like you know sneak that kiss in, or like try to have sex one more time before the comet hits the earth. And this is just like. Why is why is sex? <laughs> why is pleasure? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it just it doesn't matter anymore. And all on in that same vein, yeah, the fact that everyone is so ill, malnourished, sick, perhaps dead, uh, irradiated, <laughs> alive, dead, or a dog. <laughs> yeah, yeah, alive, dead, or a dog, or or dreaming, or being dreamt of. Um, they yeah. all, yeah, they're all just barely hanging on. They're like shadows, and so. You know, for a lot of these characters, the soldiers and this, you know, group that he, that Ilyushenko comes upon with Vasilisa's body, and for Ilyushenko and Vasilisa and Kronauer by extension, and a lot of the people who live at Radiant Terminus, um, yeah, they're just like shadows of human beings. Um, and basically, ha them having bodily desires, they basically don't defecate anymore, we're told as well. You know, there's yeah. kind of a lot of these bodily processes have ceased. Mm -hmm. You know what I didn't thought of until you said that? And maybe I'm wrong about this, but it is almost like they don't have bodies, but are they ever actually physically described? I guess on 133, the uniforms are in tattered, stripped of any distinctive insignia, more were they prisoners of war than soldiers of the field. But they're very much, I feel like none of these characters are well defined in terms of their looks, except for, I guess, the woman is, the one, the middle, da the, the the daughters are. Miriam, I mean, yeah. Solovey is always described but that's as, what I was like, gonna say. So in weird and everything. I mean, they, but the other things they talk about always, just even flipping, so full disclosure for anyone who has not caught on yet, I, you know, last read this book when it was going to print, um, however many years ago, so my memory of it is um, not as detailed, but there's a lot of description of, the clothing, like you mentioned, Chad, the soldiers' um, clothing. There's mention of Vasilisa's rags being smelling, yeah. um, just smelly, reeking. So everything is, it just smells and old material, I suppose. And that's what makes a person now. Yeah. And then, but like you say, so going on to chapter 10, they move um, Vasilisa to the, the, I guess, the nuclear plant, right? The building. Anyways, and yep. Solovey's inside there with um, Moragovian or whatever his name is. Um, and he is described fully. Like, yeah. in a, there's a whole paragraph on the 42 that describes him. And that's what made me, th as you're saying that about the bodies and about about whether they're shadows and not, it made me think that like a lot of these main characters are very nebulous, whereas Solovey is like 100% physically there in but a way that like that, no one else is. But don't you think that if you had to, I mean, if we brought in a sketch artist, you could, I feel like I could describe what these characters look like besides Solovey. I don't know. I I don't pay attention maybe enough to, <laughs> to their descriptions. I think it could, I guess, uh, maybe. Like, I just envision, like, Walking Dead-looking people. I mean, yeah, but that's, that's, yeah. Which would, which would work. Yeah, I suppose, yeah, I suppose you, you get a sense of what they are. But, like, I wonder if that's how intentional that is, that Solovey is, like, physically present and described in such is such in, intricate detail, even down to like, this man had a sheep's clo sheepskin cloak wrapped around his shoulders, was dressed in a blue, deep blue music shirt that was perfect, silky, unwrinkled, with billing gray serge pants tucked into wax boots. And if he hadn't had a rifle on his shoulder and a robber's axe and his massive black belt, he could have come straight out of a tranquil story of an unchanging Russian or Siberian village. Like that's a lot more specific than Kronauer or like they're sort of like, they're described as like what they have on them, less about like, I mean, yeah. this is too, um, but then it keeps talking about how he's like giant. Like he's mm -hmm. a giant dude, and he's, he's got the, the yellow gaze. He's the, the, the golden Paul Bunyan fire. of Volodin Land. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. exactly. Also, it's great because this is where we learn that he lied. Um, that because remember back in part one, Kronauer uh, is told that Solove and Moragovian are going off to where they found him or where he was at the Red Star to save his friends, and they're like, they weren't there; they're gone. And now we find out that that was completely not true. That Solovey did meet Ilyushenko and Vasilisa and convinced Ilyushenko to leave her with with 
that with him because he can take her back to the Red Star or to mm -hmm. back to Radiant Terminus and save her because she's neither dead nor alive. We will save her. We can fix her. <laughs> is what he keeps saying. Um, so like, Ilyushenko leaves her. She's like scavenged up a girlfriend for his son-in-law. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that is in this chapter, right? Where yeah, it's like, yeah. so it talks about like um, about like, how. Don't worry, Morgan will take good care of her. He made a yeah. mistake and married my daughter, but he's all right. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> she won't be living or dead, nor a dog. <laughs> I won't hide that once she's revived, I'll give her to Morgovian. <laughs> um, yeah, and uh, and this one goes back to like. Oh yeah, and your comrade Cronauer won't know anything about her. He's got some sort of infectious unhappiness in him. Uh, for the, me, the, this man will always be accompanied by a woman dying or dead. So it's back to that line about Cronauer. So like, yeah, so Solvay's game plan is to like take Vasilisa, revive her through like a mind thing again, and or the heavy, heavy, light, light water of Grandma Ogdal maybe, mm. who knows, but like revive her. Um, and there is a bit about that at the end where it says that she's, able to understand the words and she perceives them as vague echoes and waited for what happened next. So she's not completely dead, but I don't know that in this world, people can be reborn in so many or come back to life so many ways or can live forever that death is like, death isn't, death isn't our death exactly. Um, but so yeah, so he's going to take her, put her in the basement, get her back up to working condition and give her to more Govian. Yeah. Back up to work. That's, that's like, yeah, that's pretty as as bad as that sounds. That's pretty much what his plan is. This guy's a mess. Like he's not good. He's it was big it, bad. It was funny too when they when Shanko brought her in the teen room reactor. Uh, Solovier is like, oh, good, you brought your daughter. Yeah, yeah. And and he's like, no, she's not my daughter. And then he's like, oh, that must be your wife then. Yep. You know, because those two terms for Solovie are clearly kind of somewhat synonymous, at least related, wife and daughter. And also for him, like, seemingly women don't exist in any other. I mean, it's yep. very much an old fashioned idea of like, well, they're either possessed by a husband or by a father. So they've got to be one of those things, right? It's either someone's daughter or someone's wife, because how else would you be walking around with them? Right. Which yeah. is also how he kind of doesn't understand, he doesn't want to understand that Cronauer just put Samia on his back and brought her into back to Radiant Terminus. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he thinks something fishy must have happened because what else would two people, a man and a woman, be doing together on a journey yep. other than, you know, something lascivious or whatever? Because obviously he's a. Uh, He's yeah. fucked up in that regard. Well, just a few lines down from what you're saying, he even, Sylvia even says, for me, wife or daughter, it doesn't matter. He says, oddly proud. So, yeah, there's that. This guy just, is horrible. Yeah. I think I wanted to mention before we move on from these pages, something that I remember now sort of strikes me. And I think, Rhett, you were talking about it um, or alluding to it a little bit about just people not knowing how to exist anymore is the dialogue like it takes it takes Ilyushenko a bit to warm up but when he gets to the soldiers and they're like we don't eat flesh and he just goes oh <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. like that's his response and then when he's talking to Solovier and he's like well what is she and Ilyushenko says well she's dead like yeah. It's just interesting mm -hmm. that the, the inability to function in conversation whereas the people who it's just it's interesting to see the different the different degrees of deterioration um not just mentally but you know um vocally or in in conversation it's it's crazy like i'm just flipping through and remembering how awesome this book is so that that, that i kind of put a put a mark down about that too because that ties into something i want to talk about in one of the next two chapters but about the way that communication happens in this in this world is is uh, strange and mysterious. But one thing that I forgot to do at the beginning that I have to tell you guys now is like a moment of comic relief after uh, after uh, what's his name, Solove, you know, gets himself a dead dead person, um, dead woman for his son-in-law. Um, is that one of the 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 Voladine things is that your dreams that you have after reading are important? And I I've, I've been recounting some of my Voladine dreams on this on this podcast, and I don't think this is necessarily one. But last night I had a very very detailed, very long dream about recording this episode of the two month review. And um, it took place in like this majestic hotel slash bookstore slash uh, 
clothing shop slash restaurant slash orchestra that was here in Rochester that had like a huge entertaining deck out in the middle of like a lake. And as part of this, we we're going to record the two month review with a bunch of different people from the bookstore from whatever. And there's like appetizers and blah, blah, blah. And I recorded it carrying my computer around, like literally like carrying it from one person <laughs> to another. And there was like a part where there's like 40 booksellers is like, why don't we just open up to questions to the audience and all these booksellers had questions about Radiant Terminus and we're going, going, going. And it was like a two hour long podcast. And I was like, man, this is too long and I have to cut it down. Hour and a half is about all that anyone would listen to. And it was like, I mean, it was super, super detailed. And everyone was, was there. And as soon as we ended, everyone just started drinking like tons and ordering tons of food. It was out on this deck. And Anthony, um, our marketing publicity person, was out there. And he was talking to me. He was drinking a, a big can of like of Genesee beer and talking, which I know that he wouldn't drink, and um, and talking about how cool it would be to own paddle boards so he could go through the the lake and paddleboard around is like, shit, I have two paddle boards at home. That would be really fun. And we're like, yeah, let's go. We gotta go paddle boarding sometime. And then all of a sudden, like everyone, I wanted to leave and everyone started to leave and we got the bill and it was $35,000 for, for, <laughs> for this party that we threw because there was like a $5,000 fee for destroying so much shit at this fancy hotel <laughs> because of the ragtag booksellers that were invited. <laughs> and some guy was trying to get me to give him $7,000 for his iPhone that he lost. It was like absurd. I was like, no, I can't do this. Like this is so bad. I am so fired. Like I'm 100% <laughs> fired because uh, you can't spend $35,000 on a two month review party at all. <laughs> so Volodyne got in my brain in a weird way last night, like not in the usual like spiders way, but in like a way of like some obscene amount of guilt and like the, the fucking bourgeoisie, man. Bourgeoisie, come at me. They're $35,000 charges for some beer, some Genesee beer. In fact, that's bullshit. Jenny Light doesn't cost no $35,000. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> that's my segue. So the next section though, chapter 11 is interesting to me because this is one where Ilyushenko goes to the soldiers and they accept him in. And they accept him in after on like page 160, they have the long interrogation, which I love, where like the commander asked Ilyushenko his name and interrogated him about his service status, his relationship to egalitarian ideology, his military abilities, but also the camps, general human happiness, the assassination of those responsible for general unhappiness, his connection to animality, to brotherhood, to Bolshevism, and to shamanism in general. The interrogation finished, he told Ilyushenko that he still hesitated to attribute the status of soldier or prisoner to him, but he didn't see any reason to refuse his presence in the convoy. So he gets accepted in, and then we get the story of that captain, Umrag Batushin. And this becomes almost like essentially a Soviet realist story of like how he made it through this shitty childhood um, with his with his uh, with his mom, who like is basically again with the rape, is like come upon by a group of bandits who quickly surround and collectively rape her and then take her to their sort of commune where he grows up and learns how to be, shoot rifles, learns how to like read the right things, knows how to get rid of the petty bourgeoisie and like what should happen. And then he is able to then join the army and be a successful soldier and is now like the captain of this convoy. So it's like a weird, like all out of nowhere, we have like all this stuff that's like sci-fi and whatever else. And this sort of is too, but it's like hearkening back to those old Soviet realist tales of like how the, the proletariat mm -hmm. soldier with their, can become part of this greater, um, greater system by like giving up their pers personality and becoming and learning the right things and being able to like achieve that. But it also sort of has like, uh, I mean, it's a, it's a bit more twisted than that, I guess. Yeah, it's I, funny at time at times this, uh, I mean, you kind of mentioned this idea of genre with this book or how do we classify this? And then the previous, um, in the couple episodes I've listened to so far, you've talked about as possibly speculative fiction or having the sci-fi element definitely belonging to some sort of post-apocalyptic um, uh, disaster genre. Mm -hmm. um, but at the other, on the other hand, like, yeah, you're right. In this section, it seems like a, you know, this could be a Tolstoy short story <laughs> about, you know, a, pe a peasant growing up in a lumber camp, et cetera. Yep. Um, and also with Solovier, especially, it he feels like a character out of a fairy tale, like Bluebeard, oh, yeah. or something, something out of a, a genie out of Thousand and One Nights, or something. Mm -hmm. It really has like this almost uh, mythic or fairy tale quality to it. And it does kind of bump in and out of 
or jump in and out of these different um, genres. Because at times, you know, it doesn't really feel there's no science fiction element or speculative fiction element. And then all of a sudden you'll have it or at other times you get no backstory about the characters. And then you get this three page tale about uh, Umruk and his, you know, terrible childhood, et cetera, and how he ended up on this train. Yeah. Absolutely. And it's really, of, and it's funny because it's of no consequence because it's the captain changes every week. Yeah. <laughs> so it's not like he's this important <laughs> dude to the entire convoy. It's, it's no. almost at random. Like he's the flavor, the the flavor the of the week. week. But that's like, yeah, yeah like, like, yeah, they're part of the, the you got to be equal. Everyone's, everyone's fine. I love the the part of this in 165 where like, he's getting ready to leave. From the doorstep of his cottage, Umrug Batushin went back over the basics of what he knew. He taught lessons on the necessity of collective discipline in the tundra. He discussed the ways of eradicating the idea of individual profit when there is nothing but lichen to eat and the temperature was below negative 40 Celsius. <laughs> um, like the idea of individual profit. I love all the, all the like Marxist Leninist bits that come in here are, are my favorite. So this is going to be a rather ignorant question, but do we, just as I don't remember, do we know why Volodyne chooses the sort of Soviet backdrop or well, the, I mean, it's, because... it's easy, <laughs> it's easy to function in, but it's, I don't know if we know from an article or interview why he I, does this. I don't, but I can speculate that part of the the one of the main themes that keeps coming up is the relationship between people um, and to try and have like a human relationship, and that the Soviet sort of ideology was that everyone, brother or sister, everyone was equal, and that that would allow you to be free and to be able to have meaningful relationships with people because they weren't being interfered with by capitalists and by by people who are extracting value from you and putting you into a capitalist system in which you must like try and achieve more, try and buy things, trying to be an individual so you are separated away from your brotherhood. So like the Soviet is the counter to that. And that that capitalist viewpoint really dovetails with what you're saying about myths and about like fairy tales and about those stories that get passed down over and over in which there is a big bad wolf that is evil and that is restraining people from being able to connect or injuring them or hurt, harming them as humans and as as a society as a whole. And that the more that you're, those myths infiltrate and that the more that that system has infiltrated your mind, you can no longer become human. And so like the Soviet Union setup was like the last attempt, the second second Soviet Union was an attempt to have that more human thing and to have like, they had the nuclear reactors in all over the world providing like free energy to, is referenced later in this chapter, I think, the free energy to everyone throughout the world. Yeah. Everyone could live, you could live in these communes and not have to worry about money or goods or anything. And then the capitalist system, which is tied into these these myths of like being in power, of being the, the, the solve that's in power and that can control someone else or can take something from someone else, those resurface as everything starts to falls apart. And that I think that that's the that sets up like this clear delineation between like that society didn't work either um, for because it just broke essentially like they're like it just gave up and that this being re infiltrated you're in this this space where like you had this you've had capitalism capitalism's trying to make its re rise with all of its like bad fascist overtones and like the micro level of Solove but also they keep alluding to it being on a macro level of like these capitalists that are rising up or whatever so you have a landscape now in which your characters have to are pulled in those two directions and have to find a new way to exist like if they can't if the the camp is bad if the red the, the radiant terminus is bad because solove is essentially hitler then and the soviet union no longer exists because the people went insane um and the commanders were like doing crazy shit and it fell apart and they don't have that what is the what is another path like how can you be human and connect with people when you when you don't have any larger structure it was like alluded to early on too with like where they say like because of um ideology we forgot how to connect or we forgot how to like just treat each other without like all this terminology and the soviet stuff plays into that too because everyone keeps using those terms like are you you know, what's your view on shamanism? What's your view on brotherhood? How do you relate to Bolshevism? Are you good? And they interrogate everyone in like that Soviet way, which uses like hard, heavy words to define people. And because that's sort of broken apart, they don't have a new system. So I feel like this is like that in-between space between these systems. And that's kind of why it's set in this landscape. That's my that's my okay. take on it. That's the that's the the short version. <laughs> that's a yeah. Yeah. No, that's that's that makes complete Fair. sense. And while you were while you were saying that. I started thinking also tangentially more about what Rhett was saying about the myths and the fairy tales. 
is it possible that this is sort of Volodine's version of the Brothers Grimm stuff, unlike Hans Christian Andersen all put together? So, like, you sort of have, like, Chad, you said the big bad wolf. We have sort of a little Red Riding Hood theme of, like, over the river, through the woods. Um, yeah. There's sort of, like, the Sleeping Beauty theme with, like, this these sections of bringing Vasilisa in, and they're like, oh, we can take care of it. Like, it's fine. Um, and that's also sort of a little bit of a Snow Whitey theme of, like, sleeping. So I'm wondering yeah. how many other fairy tales can be connected in ways like that i've just i've never thought about it like that before so now my brain is yeah, over I overacting i haven't either but that does make a lot of sense and it is sort of like the whole landscape is like a consciousness of humanity of mm -hmm. like all these little stories or myths or or um systems that exist within this larger sphere which might really just be solvay's mind and is the, radiant, is the radiant is the radiant terminus reactor glorious routine. end is it or or is it an inverted jack and the beanstalk oh <laughs> uh, fair fair he is a giant yeah they keep referencing True. that and and, yeah. and at some point the, both uh grandma and solovier are referred to as monsters i mean yeah. there is sort of this language of the um of the you know of mythology or fairy tales uh throughout I also wanted to ask, um, so at times, so for the most part, this is all written in, um, in the past tense, although at times it, it, there's a switch to the present tense. Mm -hmm. And it's also written um, at, at times also the, na the narrator really doesn't exist within the world of this novel, except for occasionally, say, yep. you know, we were sitting out there or yep. we were in this state. And not just like the broader picture of the fall of the Second Soviet Union, the takeover of all the urban, uh, all the urban centers by these fascist capitalists, but also like the specifics of the plot, like we were sitting by the train or something. Yep. Is yeah, this, it's does this so occur weird. in other of his books, or I was trying to figure out what to make of that use of the first person plural. There, I, I'm trying to think if there is a specific time where that comes up. I think it's in, okay, so in that, there's a um, two-part self-interview that he gave for like the new inquiry. And it talks a little bit about how authors, an author isn't a singular author, it's like a we. And it starts to talk about defining the narrator within that. Um, and it's like, it's Volodine like, it's, it's Volodine like extreme. So it's like a lot of like little bits and pieces that are sort of funny and that are sort of like uh, both philosophical and don't like, all connect into like one strong linear argument. Um, but there is something in there about this sort of narrative technique of like that is that there is no singular single narrator to define the story that it's part of everyone. So when you talk, we always talk as we. Okay. Um, and I feel like that's kind of what comes up in here is that where you would have that narrator is generally we, and it will say like us, like all of us were sitting there or we haven't found that out yet or we'll find as we'll see in the near future sure. like and i think that i wonder if that's like related to that sort of idea that there can't be a single narrator of or single author of a book all authors are the author all post exotic authors are authoring all post exotic books at all points in time huh that's what i kind of right. took it as which i guess but related so okay so chapter 12 moving past that one this is an interesting one because this is like they go to their camp um, it tells the story of like how this convoy has been searching for a camp. They've been searching for a commune to that will be the best commune ever. But it has also a dreamlike vision to it, where the search the search for this like imaginary you know collective um, on the rails for concentration haven has already lasted months, if not some incalculable bardic time. The diesel tractor never broke. Fuel supplies and problems never cropped up, and is in the, if and. As in a nightmare where everything repeated endlessly, the convoy slowed, slowly devoured kilometers week after week, shaking and jolting and roughing up its human cargo day and night. So, like, there's something mysterious about this train that can just keep going all over the place without, like, without needing fuel in search of this this heaven. And this is the part two where we get um, the, the songs. So, like, this, as I wrote down here, Bob Hope, Matthias Boyle. As a comedian <laughs> in an agit prop troupe, so, so Bob Hope going around staging playlets and themes to help make people laugh um, as part of this the Soviet thing. They're singing about how the camps are like the most beautiful, freeing, am amazing place in the world, and that's where they need to go is like this mythical camp, which kind of ties back into what I was saying of like finding a way, 
like the Soviet Union's gone, but maybe we can get to this commune. Um, maybe, it, maybe it could be Anthony's commune um, that that would be like cult like, but not with any of that crazy sex stuff. Um, and and this camp would be where they could all like have their be free and have the most beautiful gesture of freedom. And so they keep thinking about the camps and singing these songs. Um, I, I don't want to talk too much, but I do want to say one other thing. So this is what when you said, Kaya, something about how they take some while to communicate. This is the most eloquent these people are, is when they're singing about the camp and it's all in song and performance. And yep. it's like it's, it's mouthing the words or mouthing the ideas, mouthing the ideology, mouthing that, Just going that through vision the emotions. and not not they, they don't speak and they don't interact normally. But they mm -hmm. like they're all like, yes, like all the, the lines of like their dialogue are like, you know, nonsense or not nonsense, but just like, sure. For me, wife or daughter, it doesn't matter. The new captain said in a glum voice, mm -hmm. um, which is another part I want to talk to you. But this part is like the singing seems to be so vital. And that seems to go back into that post exotic art is part of like life as part of the way that like messages get through um, their performance as a comedian with a jawbone and a whatever else um, is the way that they can harmonica as they can, they can communicate. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the other thing related to that though, so here's that not wa not my wa daughter, my wife, for me, wife or daughter, it doesn't matter. The new captain said is a moment where Ilyashenko thinks that Solovey is inflected and taken over the world, that this isn't a coincidence, but that Solovey is somehow with them. And that's where I started thinking about this kind of idea that that is like those myths or fairy tales where Solovey put this idea into the world and therefore that's how people can interpret how people interpret it that is part of like that system that logical system is infectious almost meme like and like takes over and it's one of the things that they're battling against is not just like solo as a human being or the camp or the radiant terminus as like a place where people are like mind mind raped but like it's the ideas behind it are infiltrating all of everyone he's yeah, irradiating them yeah and fair. and and to me, this gets like at a bigger question, and it was something you meant. It goes back to what you mentioned about uh, in the introductory episode, where Vol Volodin said, uh, apparently, with regard to his work, it's less about the work itself than the dreams you have uh, while you're reading it or that are infected by it. And of course, within his universe, the world has been infected by Marxist Lenin. Marxist Leninist thought, and of course, like the sort of anarcho capitalist hell that is that is reigning uh, during this during the period of the books. Um, and so that's like, you know, two more iterations of like uh, infectious ideas. And then also the post exotic writers within this world are trying to like, you know, reinfect within the world of uh, you know, these two opposing poles kind of reinfect the world. And Volodin himself is doing that thing. And there, there is something to that, this idea that um, uh, language and art and uh, narrative, gener you know, more broadly speaking, uh, has the capability of like changing our understanding of the world, of ourselves, of our place within it. And so you have like all these writers who are kind of myth makers, these systems that have, you know, existed for years, the Marxist Leninist one and the capitalistic one. And then you have, you know, this, this sort of, this very devious um, dreamer and poet and writer, of course, you know, so Solo, Solovie is also, you know, a writer and poet and fancies yes, himself true. an artist in that regard. But in a, you know, there seems to be this idea that it, you know, books and narrative and poetry they, and songs, they have the ability to sort of infect the world and uh, change it in a, in a very real way. That's, that's very true. And there, it's interesting in contrast, like their glorious hymn for the camps to like Sol Solovey's uh, crazy ass, like fire and bird and death and blackness poetry that like gets in your head for 1916 years or whatever yeah, as yeah. all good poetry does <laughs> it is it is it is a, oh I, I forgot one of the other great jokes in this part i think is 173 where they introduced a soldier named i i would only pronounce this i'd fuck Siobin. excuse me i'd fuck, oh, yeah, yeah. I'd fuck uh and then whatever sobabian i mean so i'd say it's, 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 but that's it's, okay it's, nope i'd fuck yeah. it's i'd fuck 
Yeah, no, I, I'm going with the uh, Freudian pronunciation of id yep. fuck. Yeah. <laughs> id fuck, id fuck. <laughs> yeah, that's even better. Id fuck, id fuck said Bibian. So Bibian. Either way, it's great. I love that. These are um, these are really touching scenes where they're kind of around the campfire. Yeah. And singing these, you know, hymns of praise to this heavenly camp that they're apparently approaching. This, yeah, it's so wild. The the camp becomes the only place in the world where fate deceives nobody because it conforms concretely to what anyone can expect or await him or her. Like it is like it is defining. Like it is religious too. We did talk about this on one episode about some of the religious mentions that kind of come up or religious stuff that floats around. And this has that defining like a heaven. They're singing like an, a hymn to a heaven. And and maybe that's like, maybe if they could finally die, they would get to the camp. But instead they just go back and forth on their train that can seemingly travel anywhere on the continent. Yeah, this is, well, I mean, this is something else I wanted to ask, but I mean, at some point it's very clear that like, every, maybe everyone's dead. Perhaps everyone's being dreamt of by Solovie. Yeah. Um, people Jacob's are dying and scenario. coming back. Yeah, people are dying and coming back to life. And so it's very unclear in this. I mean, it's just a world where those distinctions are very blurry. Yeah. Um, well, what do you guys make of going back to 173 at the top? So I think Chad mentioned that this is the chapter where Ilyashenko is like, oh, we might, like, Solovie is everywhere. And so Ilyashenko's sort of rubbing his tattoos and taking comfort in the hammer and sickle still being there. And then he thinks, fortunately, there was still Marxism, Leninism, he thought, otherwise we'd be in a filthy, shitty nightmare. Who knew yep. if we'd be able to differentiate between classes and even between the living, the dead, and even the dogs or that kind of thing. So, I mean, what do you, what do you <laughs> think or make of that? Like, is that the most sort of reverse lucid moment in the book? Or not the most, but I mean, like, I, it seems it seems so, pretty aware, but in the wrong direction. See, this is the, one of the ones where I feel like, okay, so everyone has to have a ideology or a set of terms in which to define the world. Mm -hmm. And without Marxist Leninism, he wouldn't be able to define the world. It would be, all the classes would be the same, living dead and dogs would be the same. And like, they need the terminology or they need the, that belief system to be able to interpret what's happening. Yeah. Almost like almost like the way that you have whatever your subconscious structure is is how you interpret a dream or like enter into a dream. That has I, I sort of take it as that, and that he's still in the Marxist Leninist thought because they believed in this. This yeah, and they still I, believe in the, the things. But I do think that I feel like it is very dreamlike. But I think it's, it's supposed to be ambiguous. So, it's so frustrating though, because he's thinking that, like, well, otherwise we'd be in a filthy, shitty nightmare. And it's like, well, what are you in now? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. And it's so <laughs> shitty. Like is this, <laughs> and maybe and maybe he's thinking that now just because he's finally with a group of people who aren't all dying and pulling them like it's not Cronauer and Vasilisa like he's he's unburdened of that. I guess. I, I've it's, actually, it's just such a weird thing to think. Yeah, I like that moment, and I I, I too, I think you characterize it really well when you said it's like this, you know, accidentally very lucid thought. You know. Yeah. Well, if we didn't have Marxism, Leninism, which is like this true, you know, the this the true narrative, right? Uh, we'd be just in a filthy, shitty nightmare. There's another part like that where there's something. It's like a kind of a. It's a, ends up being kind of a joke when Cronauer first encounters Solovie. Solovie says, Cronauer uh, says, "I haven't eaten or." had anything to drink in the last few days. And Solovia says to him, well, are you dead? And for a moment, because of the nature of this book, you think like, oh shit, is Cronauer dead? He might be. And, and, and then he, he answers, you know, I'm alive. And Solovia says, well, there you go. What are you complaining about? You're still alive. Yeah, that's... You know, it's, it's something like a joke, but you do get this sense of like, oh shit, yeah. That's a very yeah, Soviet-esque joke of like, it's that, yeah. that, that rang very like golden cap to me of a... Uh... <laughs> Of like, well, what are you complaining about? You're standing here complaining, so you're fine. <laughs> yeah, that's true. So the the last chapter they were covering for this week is um, one in which he takes. So so this is where Ilyashenko gets to become captain because <laughs> why not? Um, <laughs> and because uh, that's just how it goes. Um, and then he he has some more dreams about Solovey because he keeps seeing yellows, and every yellow is re references that and believes that that's part of it. 
Um, and then you get a story. So instead of like the hymns of the last chapter, where it was like glorifying the camps, we get something that's a little darker in which they say that camp is like the best place possible, blah, blah, blah. And the story is about someone who tries to escape and they try and capture them and say like, this is, you know, anyone who leaves the camps, every escapee is condemned to ruination. Fleeing our collective means throwing yourself to the wolves. It means facing terrible moments of fear and pain all alone as if there aren't already enough when we're together. The escapee has no future. We can certainly say and explain nothing can replace the camp. Nothing is as necess necessary and healthy as a camp, which takes a different tone of like the camp is both like glorious, but now it's like also like prison like. Like when the guy tries to escape, they get up and shine the light and try and find him. The escapees are like, that's bad. Don't do that. Um, the camp is the most important thing. Um, the yeah, and like even like they they make it very clear at the end where it's talking about everyone knows. Everyone knows that the camp is the only unimaginary place where life is worth the trouble of being lived. Perhaps because our awareness of being alive is enriched by awareness of being such in the company of others, an effort of collective survival, an effort that's certainly useless and difficult, but with a nobility unknown on the other side of the barbed wire. Um, so, yeah, so the barbed wire, the I was fulfilled when we see how ultimately classes have been abolished all around us. So that that communist bit too, where it's like, yeah, the camps are the best, just you can't, it's so much better than that, than the what's beyond the fence that we've got you <laughs> trapped in. It's like fucking Scientology. It's like <laughs> David Miskiewicz like locking up his uh, wife in like one of her, one of their, one of their camps with the barbed wires coming <laughs> in so that you can't get out. <laughs> well, yeah, the, I hope we don't get sued for that. Um, <laughs> Whatever, fuck I you, Scientology. I disavow that. Uh, yeah, so. yeah. You guys can separate yourself. I say, fuck you, Scientology. <laughs> I've gone clear. I disavow. Um, <laughs> the statements made on this podcast no way reflect the. <laughs> no way reflect the University of Rochester. <laughs> and actually, to to that end, I'm going to defend the camp here. Okay. Uh, because it does. So it seems it's unclear, like who is running this camp. It has like kind of a mythical existence. Yeah, but it seems perhaps that it's like a camp, and also we should keep in mind that the this group that's taking the train to the camp, it, at some point they were soldiers and detainees, and yeah. now they just kind of have switched spots, and everyone's it's become very egalitarian. Yeah, right. They're all just in this filthy, shitty nightmare. Yeah, and there is no real reason for anyone to try to escape, or if they do, to give a shit and recapture them. Um, like no one, truly no one really cares and they all just want to get to this camp. But the camp, the way it's described it rang, the thing that it made me think about, and obviously this book has like these really, um, like unavoidable themes of political themes, obviously, but also environmental, that touches on environmental disaster, basically rendering the entire planet uninhabitable for, for most of humanity. Or allowing you also, to live forever. Yeah, 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 exactly. So, you know, hard to say if global warming is going to kill us all or somehow create a mutant race that can, you know, live for hundreds of years. Man. But it, but it brought up these, like, metaphysical questions of, like, um, that reminded me of Schopenhauer when he says something to the effect of, you know, being born, we, sh we can look on being born as a pr prison sentence. Yeah. Where we're all in unjustly... Uh, incarcerated for life on this planet. And the only thing to do is to kind of take pity on each other and aid each other, which is the idea of this camp. It's like finally in the yeah. camp, we're all, we're all equal and all we can do is sort of help each other out. And there is no or oppressor, despite the fact that they're in this, you know, that they're being jailed. And it seemed like an after metaphor for existence generally. Yeah. It's but, I just have two new thoughts. One is like, so their their camp, like as the people that are in this convoy, I think is like very egalitarian and good. Then the stories that they're telling, like some of the stories from the past are like the kind of life lessons, sort of like the myths of the communist side. So if we have mm -hmm. like the big bad wolf and those kind of fairy tales, these are, so the story of like someone trying to escape and how that's bad is like telling them like, you're not going to leave our camp because you'd get screwed. Yeah. Like, don't do that. Like, um, so it's sort of like a warning like that. Um, Oh shoot, I had another thought as you were saying that. Um sorry, my phone died. <laughs> okay. Um wow, what was it? What was I gonna say? Like the oh damn, I forgot it. Doesn't matter, it'll come back to me. About the the camp itself or about these places that they're that they're in and the Schopenhauer thing. Ah, forget it. 
I'll think of it in a minute. But yeah, I, I agree with you. It is like it is like they're entering into that. And this and I see these these kind of stories that they're telling as part of like the that opposite, the Lenin Marxist myth. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I'll I'll read a passage here to that describes that if you don't mind. Yeah, yeah. At the bottom of 192. Uh in this, you know, song or this hymn about the camp, uh Matthias Boyol, the uh being the Bob Hope of this uh, <laughs> of this train car, uh, says, we see how ultimately classes have been abolished all around us. Elsewhere, outside, everyone has to wait for periods of disaster or wars for an equivalent sentiment to arise. The camp doesn't need successive cataclysms or bombs raining down for its inhabitants to enjoy mutual aid and fatalistic brotherhood. And that idea of fatalistic brotherhood, like everything has gone to shit, but at least we, you know, we aid each other and we feel each other's pain. Um, but I don't know. It seems like it's like a philosophical sentiment about like existing in the world in some sort of way. Yeah, I really like the next line, though, too. Everyone knows that the camp is more uncomfortable, but more fraternal than the lands that make up the rest of the world. <laughs> yeah, better off through like, strengths and numbers. That is, that is perfect. And it's like making kind of a tribes, like little tribe thing is the last thing I wrote down on that page where your your camp is your camp. No no person gifted with reason would question the humanist superiority of the society that blossomed within fences. And nobody would dare to deny the centuries of penal knowledge and constant improvements in the organization, in the philosophy, and in the intimate and fundamental logic of the camp. That's how it is. And it, all, it also has like this... <laughs> The fact that you can't fucking die, yeah. you know, like no one can just be put out of their goddamn misery. Nope. You know, it's, you it's, it's very much, it's very, it's very much like being born, you know, yeah. you're here and you have, somehow you just have to be alive for what seems like ever, you know? Yep. Um, so their state, like basically no one can be relieved of the, none of the characters we meet anyway can just fucking die and be it's, at peace. You know? it's, the, it's the real world adult version of Tuck Everlasting. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Isn't that about a dog? <laughs> no, you're thinking of uh, anything else. <laughs> okay. Where the red fern grows. <laughs> Whatever. I can never remember. What that, that, and that one's not the one about the biker gang either, apparently. No, it's not. Uh, uh, yeah, I can never keep these things straight. Um, so I don't I don't have anything else to add to this, but I do have a favorite line, and I, which I would like to read now because it's my favorite. It's a little bit longer, um, but on page 184, um, when they're getting ready for this, they're like, we're going to perform a burlesque glora fact. Tell us, Boyle, is there a difference between a burlesque glora fact and a tragic comic threnody like the one you recited for us last week? No, Pedro and Dardoff, it's exactly the same thing. It's exactly the same poetic bullshit. <laughs> that's I my, favorite, read that that's my favorite part. Um, what, do you guys have a favorite line from this sections, these sections? I was going to read that same thing. Oh, too bad. That's okay. Other than that, I, I'll go back and say it's the one where they're like, we don't eat human flesh, and the answer is just, oh. That, that is good. There's also the, another one of my favorites was on 171. The audience accompanied them by approving or voicing speeches, as we did in the old days during the Korean Pansori performances, when Korea still existed and we still believed in beauty, the future, and the impossibility of death. Mm. You got one, Rat? I do. It's 182, and it is a. Uh, it's it, Ilyushenko is thinking about Solovye, and it's this. It's this list of things that Solovye is a script. This great description of him. Yes. Uh, 182, middle of the page. Uh, this necromancer of the steps. He's come back here. This awful Kolkos matchmaker. This reviver of cadavers. This horrible shadow. This giant impervious to radiation this shamanic authority from nowhere, this president of nothing, this vampire in the form of a kulak, this strange man sitting on a stool, this abuser, this dominating man, this sleazy man, this unsettling man, this nuclear reactor creature, this godless and lordless hypnotizer, this manipulator, this monster belonging to who knows what stinking category. Mm. Hell yeah. That is solid. I love, I love that part. So yeah, so next week, um, we'll be talking about chapters 14 through 16, which takes us through the end of this um, part this uh, on, on the camps. Um, and it's pages uh, 
Oh, sorry, it goes even into a little bit of the next the next part. Um, but it's pages one ninety four through two fifty three. So we'll finish up part two and start to get into part three a little bit. Um, probably sort of mostly talk about that second part though. Um, and I'm not sure who the guest is because I still have no access to the file that had track of everything, but I'll figure it out. Um, but until then, you can always follow follow me on Open Letter um, at Twitter Open underscore Letter or Chad W Post. Kaya, you're on Twitter too. Yeah, I think it's just, uh, I keep confusing if it's, I think it's just K-M-S-T-R-A-U-M, possibly. And Brett, you are as well, correct? I am on Twitter, although I'm kind of a looky-loo. Yeah. I, a I, retweeter I, rather than a poster. That's perfectly um, fine. At, at, at on Twitter. Oh, you, you dropped out there for a second. Oh yeah, I'm here. I'm on Twitter. Okay, I'll link to it in the in the post notes too. Um, okay. I I don't I don't think I made think we can wrap it up here. So unless anyone has any final thoughts, I did my best. Good job. <laughs> Good job. No, well sometime done we'll, after not having read it for a while. <laughs> and sometime we'll have to ask about like the the editing process of it. But oh yeah, I could talk circles still, about that. <laughs> this one was loaded with other stuff, so I figured we can do that that later. Is I like that this was this is new parts cool to get into the new part and sort of start breaking this down on a larger scale. But yeah, fun book. It's a crazy book. Um, God, I wish I could remember what my joke was about the camps after you said that, but it'll come. I'll I'll put it I'll put it on Twitter when I think of it, right. and it will it'll be so out of place and and nonsense. <laughs> it'll be perfect. So there we go. Okay, so till next week, everyone. Take care. Talk to you soon. All right.